I place her thus, so that everyone may see her and recognize her. You observe she possesses the ordinary form of childhood. No one would think that the evil one has already found a servant and agent in her, yet such is the case. Well, adapting a novel, particularly a novel this complex onto the stage, is no easy task. And if we were to just take the novel and put it on stage, the, the stage would be filled with six hours of exposition and lots of furniture moving on and off stage. So what Polly Teal has done so masterfully is she's gotten to the heart of the book. And what the heart of the book is, is it's this tension in Jane between who she naturally is. The authentic Jane is strong, she's fearless, she's passionate, she's smart, she's not afraid to speak her mind, she's not afraid to stand up for what she believes in and fight against what she thinks is wrong, but she's living in a time where girls are supposed to be still and quiet and do as they're told. And so there's this conflict where Jane Eyre really wants to be a good girl, but she has an artistic spirit. And so what Polly Till has done is She's actually physically manifest this on stage. It's, it's a brilliant move because, like I said, it gets to the heart of it and it allows us to keep everything moving really, really quickly and allows us to get to the heart of the book and not get lost in a lot of different furniture moves. With, uh, with our production elements, we've embraced and followed Polly Teal's lead by getting to the essence of the play. The costumes and everything they touch is very, very much set in the time. So, you see those beautiful uh, costumes of the era. You see all of the constricting corsets that Jane has put into. But the set is very, very modern. It's very sleek. It's very flat. That allows us to go from the Moors to inside Thornfield to Lowood School very, very quickly. <laughs> I see Adele is disappointed. She had expected to see a pile of presents and finds only myself and Pilot. Okay, so in this production, many of the actors are playing musical instruments and there's a, a physical vocabulary to the world that has some choreography to it so that um, we, can, and we can move from one scene to another rather than the actors standing still and waiting for couches and chairs to be brought on. The actors are moving everything themselves and they're embodying horses and dogs. And in order to do that, we had to free ourselves from just pedestrian physical gesture and make it a much more choreographed and movement-based story. So music and dance, or music and movement, play a, a huge role in this production. And I think quite simply they help create an atmosphere beyond just simple narrative. They help us create uh, an environment that allows our concept of what's happening as viewers to be both naturalistic and at the same time wonderfully rich with the possibility of fantasy and a kind of playfulness. I saw one of uh, Peter's dance pieces and was just blown away because um, he doesn't relegate mod his modern dance to just a modern dance audience, but what he was doing was very, very theatrical. It was very rooted in character. It was very driven by intention and by acting choices. I had to, and actually KJ helped um, give license in a way to really trusting that the process in the room was going to really point us in the right direction, that it was not a situation where I was coming in with a lot of fixed choreography and teaching this, that this play wouldn't really tolerate that. It really needed to have a kind of organic and intuitive developmental process that was really collaborative. It's an opportunity for us to look at how this beautiful combination of music and movement come together to really enhance the energetic landscape, I guess of the larger experience of the play. It's not dance for dance sake, but it's choreography that speaks to what Charlotte Bronte is getting at with all of her narrative in the book. <laughs> 